بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا so inshallah ta'ala tonight we're going to move on to waraqa and we ended off last week with a very beautiful poem that waraqa offered uh, to his companion Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu ta'ala anhu waraqa eulogizing his friend the second of the two who went to Asham together to study Judaism, to study Christianity, to try to find monotheism and to prepare themselves for what Allah had promised for that region. Inshallah ta'ala, tonight we're going to go ahead and move on to Waraqa and I want to just have everyone repeat who were the four, the four of those who identified as Hanifi those that identified as monotheists. Can anyone name them? You should be able to name two of them very easily. Ubaidullah bin Jahsh. Zayd bin Amr. Waraka bin Nofil. And there's one more. No. You're close. One more person. We said there was, so there, there was Zayd bin Amr who we talked about last week. There's Waraka bin Nofil who we'll talk about tonight. There was Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh who went to Abyssinia, who migrated to Abyssinia. And there's one more who became Hanifi and uh, moved to Asham, became a Christian, moved to Asham, took up a position in the Roman Empire. What was his name? Uthman ibn al Huwaydith. Uthman ibn al Huwaydith. So these were the four people that were considered not the Hanafis, the Hanifiin, just to be clear again, all right? The monotheists, the four that were on the religion of Abraham, the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam that went out in search of that oneness of Allah. Now, out of the four, the only one that didn't become Christian was Zayd ibn Amr, right? So three of them became Christian, including Waraqa, who we'll talk about uh, tonight. Now, Waraqa is such a mysterious figure that we find in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because he shows up in the very beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari. If you all remember when we did a long series, we did Sharh al-Bukhari and we did the Book of Revelation a couple of years ago. Um, and Waraqa shows up in the very beginning of Sahih al-Bukhari. He's in the beginning of the seerah, but the seerah starts off with his death, essentially, right? You don't hear anything about his history. Uh, you know, you just know that Khadija radiallahu anha took the Prophet وسلم, to him to confirm or deny what had happened to the Prophet وسلم, or to explain what had happened to the Prophet وسلم, in Hira. And then it ends. Who was he before? What's his story? What's his status? Um, it's really a, a fascinating story. And inshallah ta'ala, I want to contextualize this as much as possible. And um, his story is so beautiful and touching uh, that I couldn't decide whether to start with him or to start with Zayd, but it just makes sense in you know, uh, setting the stage for the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here you have Waraqa and Zayd, the only two that go to Asham, that study Christianity, and that deepen their knowledge of the Abrahamic way. And then Zayd ibn Amr dies five years before the Prophet ﷺ receives revelation. So it's really just Waraqa right now in Mecca. He's the only one there that is waiting for this Prophet of Allah to arise, that has studied, that has prepared himself. And so it then obviously transfers to him and then transfers to Khadija. Uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So how is Waraqa related to Khadija? Is he her nephew? Is he her cousin? Is he her uncle? How is he related to Khadija? He's her cousin, but more like an uncle. He's her cousin, but more like an uncle because of the age gap. His name is Waraqa ibn Nofal ibn Asad. Khadija has an uncle named Nofal ibn Asad, and she has a brother named Nofal ibn Khuwaylid. Okay? So Khadija has an uncle named Nofal, who's the father of Waraqa, and she has a brother named Nofal as well. Waraqa ibn Nofal ibn Asad is the first cousin of Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now, Nofal, Khadija is Khadija bin Khuwaylid ibn Asad. Okay? Nofal and Khuwaylid are brothers, but Nofal is the oldest son of Asad, and Khuwaylid is the youngest son of Asad. And so the age gap between Khadija and Waraqa is at least, at least 25, 30 years, at least, between the two. So it's a pretty big gap. So he really plays more of a role 
of an elder, of an uncle um, in her life. Also, the father of Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, Khuwailid, passed away early on in the, uh, in, in the early wars known as the Fijar uh, wars, the early battles that took place in Mecca and claimed many of the, the senior tribesmen. That's why Khadija radiallahu anha inherited so much money and became uh, the woman that she became at such an early age when it comes to her wealth because she inherited that from her father who was killed um, early. So Waraqa is of the oldest of this clan that exists and it is considered of the most noble families of Mecca at the time. And Waraqa is considered the most noble of the noble family. So I want you to kind of just imagine the scene, right? And it'll, it'll put into context a little bit of why Waraqa never really faces much opposition from his people. Waraqa is the noble of the noble. His family are direct descendants of Amr ibn al uh, They are from this, this uh, Banu Adi. They're very, very up there. And Waraqa is elder, noble, respected. Okay? And his akhlaq are very high. His manners are very noble. And because of that, and obviously this description is true of Khadija radiallahu anha as well, that she was the most noble woman of her family. Because of that, Waraqa was actually expected to marry Khadija. Context is important here. Waraqa was expected to be the natural suitor of Khadija in terms of uh, just, just his akhlaq, the family, his character, his nobility. Khadija and Waraqa both are considered the best of their people. But Waraqa rejected this world, he became a priest, or he considered, you know, when you, when you say rahib, it could be a priest or a monk. The point is, Waraqa decided he would not get married, right? He would stay in pursuit of, uh, of, of the religion for his entire life. He would not get married. Waraqa was a zahid. He was known to be an ascetic. He spent his days in worship, his journeys in travel. Waraqa would never be in the souq. He was not someone to go to the marketplace. He only ate once a day to suffice himself, so he was known for eating very little. He rejected the wealth of his family. His tribe was naturally a very rich tribe. Waraqa did not care for it. He used to dress very simple. So Waraqa maintains celibacy, takes up the life of a, a priest or a monk, um, and you know, stays away from all of this. He also doesn't challenge his people. We said Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr, what makes him so incredible was not just that he was on this way of Ibrahim and insisting on the way of Abraham and never becomes a Christian, never becomes a Jew, just I'm on the way of Ibrahim rejects paganism and he also confronts his people all the time, right? Constantly confronting his people. Waraqa does not have that combative behavior towards his people. Khadija never worshipped idols either. She, she had an aversion to it, she didn't really care for idol worship. Abu Bakr didn't care for idol worship. Waraqa was known to be a Christian, but Waraqa was not combative. He was not out there the way that Zayd was, going after the people for the way that they were worshipping those idols. Instead, Waraqa had this idea that Allah would, would, would clarify this in due time. And so he avoids being combative uh, with the people. So he keeps to himself from society as a whole, maintains a position of high authority, is an elder, is a senior, is someone who is learned in religion, and he's also, interestingly enough, the dream interpreter of the Arabs. More context. So even though they were pagans, they were people that used to worship idols, they recognized Waraqa as a man who studied language, who studied religion, who studied philosophy, who was noble. And so the, the Arab at the time would go to Waraqa to have their dreams interpreted, even though he didn't worship the idols. Remember, the idol worshippers did not care much for their idols. They cared about the commerce the business of idol worship. They really didn't care much for Allah al Uzza. They could replace names, replace idols all they wanted. So he's a noble man. And he's someone that studied, he knows Hebrew. He has been to Asham, clearly a good man. Someone that we can go to with our dream interpretations. And so there's a very interesting dream that Khadija radiallahu anha had at a young, as a young woman. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha had a dream that the sun descended in her home. That the sun descended in her home. And you know, subhanAllah, just the connection that I was, tell, I was actually sharing with my wife, it's a, it's a really interesting connection. When Aisha radiallahu anha had a dream, she had a dream that three moons descended in her home. And she asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu what that meant, and he said that there will be righteous people that will be buried in your home. And when the Prophet died, 
Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, that's your first moon. And then when Abu Bakr died, he was the second moon. And Umar died, he was the third moon, right? Khadija has a dream of a son, the sun descending into her home. So she goes to Waraka. She tells Waraka this dream that she has. And Waraka says, it might be that you will marry a noble man or a prophet. So Waraka actually tells Khadija that there's, some, there's a special marriage in your nasib, in your destiny. You'll either marry an extremely noble man, so that's the son coming into your house, as in a spouse, or a prophet. He even mentions to her that it could be that it would even be a nabi, a prophet. Now Khadija radiallahu anha married multiple times before the Prophet ﷺ, two or three times even according to some narrations, and of course became widowed um, in the process. But this is very early on in her life. She does not know what's coming her way. Now, this is really important to put into context because we have to understand that the Prophet ﷺ was already looked at as someone very special. And he already had these bisharat, these, these, these uh, glad tidings surrounding him throughout his entire life. Miracles that would happen with the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ was born, it was a miracle. Abu Lahab goes and... Uh, and and uh, sacrifices all of these sheep in celebration of the Prophet ﷺ because of the light that came from the, the, uh, from the womb of the mother of the Prophet ﷺ when he was born. They knew he was special. And also, Waraka clearly sees something special in this young man. The Prophet ﷺ would also have other priests that saw something in him. When? To contextualize, the Prophet ﷺ only went to Asham, which is generally the land where Christianity is surviving, right? At least the Nestorian Christianity or the Christianity that Salman anhu is seeking around, that Zayd is going around and seeking around. And now uh, the Prophet ﷺ goes there twice. Twice, once as a very young man and once as the broker of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. As a very young man, as is narrated by uh, Ibn Hajar uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Al-Isaba, and it's in multiple books of Sirah, uh, Abu Talib took the Prophet sallallahu with him on a trade route to Asham very early on. And this was the habit of the Arabs, Rihlat al-Shita'i was Saif, right? So in the winter they'd go to Yemen, the summer they'd go to Asham, and they would trade with the people of Asham and come back. So Abu Talib took the Prophet sallallahu when he was a young man, um, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, a very young man, still unable to, to care for himself. And uh, while Abu Talib was there with the Prophet Sallallahu there was a rahib, a monk, that followed Abu Talib because he saw things from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he noticed the back of the Prophet Sallallahu and Khatim al nubuwa the seal of prophethood that there was a seal of prophethood on the back of the Prophet So he asked the people, he said, who's in charge of this young man? So they pointed to Abu Talib. Abu Talib said to him, um, who are, or he said to Abu Talib, who are you? He said, Ana Abi, I'm his father. Now in the language of the Arabs, Al-Am, who Al-Ab, right? The uncle, the paternal uncle in particular is the father. And Abu Talib was acting like the father of the Prophet wasallam, you know, in, in true effect. And the monk says to him, you're not his father. And he says to him, what do you mean? He said, this person, his father would not be alive. So Abu Talib is, is very interested in who, what is this man saying? Who is, what's this monk, this priest uh, saying? So the man says, he said, listen, this young man of yours did not pass by a single area until he reached Bursa, which is the area that they're in at this, at this moment, until he reached Bursa, except that the trees and the stones, sajadu lahu, they prostrated towards him. And they don't do that except for a prophet. So Abu Talib is listening to this strange priest in Asham tell him, and some of the narrations mention his name is Bahira or Buhaira, even though there's nothing authentic with his name in particular. But some of the narrations mention his name as Bahira or Buhaira. Um, Abu Talib is like, I, I have no idea what you're talking about, right? So the man says to him, he says, listen, this young man is going to be the Sayyid, the leader of the worlds. Sayyidul Alameen. He's going to be the leader 
of the worlds. And he then says to Abu Talib, where are you taking him right now? He said, I'm taking him to the marketplace. Abu Talib, he says to Abu Talib, uh, don't do that. Because if people know who he is, they might try to hurt him. Take him back to where you came and protect him and make sure that he never goes to these cities again. So Abu Talib took his advice, took the Prophet ﷺ as a young man back to Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ never went with Abu Talib again to Asham until later on when he got the big contract, right? Khadija radiallahu anha was looking for, a mudarib was looking for a, a, a broker, an honest person to take her caravans to Asham. She appointed the Prophet ﷺ. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ, for his entire life was raising sheep in Ajiyad. Ajiyad, if you actually go to the area of Ajiyad now, where they have the hotels, that's where the Prophet ﷺ said, I used to raise sheep for the qararit, for the, the pennies of the people of Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't accompany Abu Talib to Asham after that. He stayed in Ajiyad. Later on, he goes to Asham. Again, the second time he goes to Asham, who does Khadija radiallahu anha send with him? Anyone remember the name? Maysara. Right? Khadija sends Maysara with the Prophet ﷺ. Maysara falls in love with the Prophet ﷺ, says this man's character is different. He comes back to Khadija, he says that there was a cloud that never left the Prophet ﷺ. A cloud followed him. He said that, I swear that I would see the Prophet ﷺ sleeping under a tree. And when the sun would move over and the shade would no longer cover him, the tree would extend itself to cover him. And Maysara is watching these ajaib, watching these strange things happen with the Prophet ﷺ. And you got to understand, from the Prophet ﷺ's perspective, when he was a kid, Jibreel ﷺ, you know, removed removed from his heart. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ witnessed many ajaib in his life, many, many of these things in his life, but he didn't know what to make of it. Maysara doesn't know what to make of it. And uh, Maysara, he says that, I thought to myself, maybe it's just a wind, or maybe it's just coincidence that the trees shade him, and that he's just perfectly shaded throughout this entire time in Hisham. He said, except we were out there, and while, I was, while he was taking a nap and I was marveling at him, this um, monk came to me and said to me, another Rahab, priest in Hisham, he said to me, Man hadha? Who is that? So he said, I said to him, Muhammad ibn Abdullah min Ard al-Haram. Muhammad ibn Abdullah from the land of the sanctuary. The monk responded and said, only prophets rest under that tree. And just walked away from him. <laughs> so Maysara said, I had no idea what to make of this man. He said, people would deal with the Prophet ﷺ in Asham, And they would tell him, swear by Allah wal Uzza. And the Prophet ﷺ would say, I've never sworn by them before in my life. Prophet ﷺ would not take an oath with idols because that was their way of transacting was to say, take an oath on that which is holy to you. Prophet ﷺ, and they know people from Mecca hold Allah and Uzza, these two idols. The Prophet ﷺ said, I don't swear uh, for these two and I never have sworn for these two. So the point is, is that both of the times the Prophet ﷺ went to Asham, there were people that recognized something about him. There were things that were happening and Asham was the land where the people were studying or they still had the monks, the priests, the people that were the baqaya of Ahl al-Kitab that left over from the people of the book that the, that the Prophet ﷺ said Allah was pleased with in the midst of it all. Right? Waraqa and Zayd went there looking for guidance. So the Prophet ﷺ has had these things happening his entire life. Khadija radiallahu anha had that dream that was interpreted by Waraqa that you're going to marry a noble man or a Nabi or possibly even a Prophet of Allah. After the Prophet ﷺ comes back from Asham the second time, we know what happens. We'll get more into detail of it next week. But the point is, is that uh, Abu Talib, Al-Abbas, and Hamza, the uncles of the Prophet ﷺ, come with him to formally propose. Uh, Khadija's uncle, Amr ibn Asad, who was the oldest uncle that was still alive, performed the marriage, uh, I'm sorry, acted as the guardian of Khadija, and Waraqa actually performed the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija on a mahar of 500 uh, dirhams. So a very uh, small mahar. So Waraqa is the one who actually conducted their zawaj because again, he's the noble man. He's looked at as the knowledgeable man, the one who understands scripture. He's the noble man of the family and the tribe. And so he stays with Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and her. His interaction with Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ really predates uh, the incident that we all know of. 
At that point, Aisha radiallahu anha, she says in, in the hadith in which she mentions, or where she gives some context about who Waraqa uh, was, she says, He was a man who became a Christian in the days of ignorance. So Waraqa, unlike um, Zayd, actually identified as a Christian. وَكَانَ يَكْتُبُ الْكِتَابَ الْعِبْرَانِيَّةِ فَيَكْتُبُ مِنَ الْإِنْجِيلِ بِالْعِبْرَانِيَّةِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَكْتُبُ So he used to write from the Gospels in Hebrew, and he would write as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to write. So he actually had full command of Hebrew, and he would write from the Gospels or write of his lessons and what he was learning and, and, and compiling in Asham. So he's one of the few literate people as well, right? Literate not just in Arabic and reading and writing, literate even in Hebrew in reading and writing. So she says, وَكَانَ شَيْخًا كَبِيرًا قَدْ عَمِيَ And then he became an old man and he lost his sight. So Waraqa became blind at, towards the end of his life. When the Prophet ﷺ um, had come to him, at that point, he was already blind. He was in his 90s and he was already blind. Okay, and this is where we have the famous incident that takes place, right? Where Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha would take the Prophet وسلم, to Waraqa to contextualize what had happened in Hira. It was common for the people to go to Waraqa and Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha has a particular relationship. The Prophet وسلم, has a particular relationship and he understands, uh, especially understands uh, what it is what it is that would um, denote prophethood or denote something that is special. So Khadija radiallahu anha takes the Prophet وسلم, to Waraqa. And this is what Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know any better. This is just one of the ways that Khadija radiallahu anha was already acting in accordance with revelation before it even came. Right? Khadija radiallahu anha was guided towards the good ways. It was her suggestion to take the Prophet وسلم, to Waraqa and that was her fitrah, that was her goodness, and that was there. And so we get to the, the narration. So after the Prophet ﷺ has calmed down a bit, Khadija radiallahu anha and the Prophet ﷺ walk to the house of Waraqa. This man who predicted, who prophesied, or who said that Khadija would one day marry a, a noble man or a Nabi. He's in his 90s, he's blind, he is sitting there. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha says to him, فَقَالَتْ لَهُ خَدِيجَ يَا ابْنَ عَمِّي إِسْمَعْ مِنْ إِبْنِ أَخِيكَ O oh uh, oh son of my uncle, uh, listen to the son of your brother, Ibni Akhik. Okay? Uh, why did she say Ibni Akhik? Some of the scholars mentioned that it's just a means of showing the closeness that the Prophet ﷺ had to Waraqa, that he was like the nephew of Waraqa. Right? That the Prophet ﷺ was like the nephew of Waraqa. Actually, others actually point to the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu and Waraqa, that they were actually, uh, they had the same amount of ancestors from Qusay ibn Kilab, so they are, they are related, their lineage is related, and Waraqa is in fact uh, the third cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the point is, is that this is a, uh, this is a means of, of presenting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, listen to what he has to say to you. So Waraqa says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya ibn akhi, madha tara? O oh, son of my brother, madha tara? What do you see? Why do you think he asked him, what do you see? Because we said Waraqa was a dream interpreter. Waraqa assumed that that's probably what it is that he's coming to ask him about. Right? Tell me what you have seen. So at that point, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa akhbarahu Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam khabara ma ra'a. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tells him everything that he saw in the cave of Hira. فَقَالَ لَهُ وَرَقَ هَذَا النَّمُوسِ الَّذِي نَزَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَى مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ So this is the namus that Allah has sent to Musa alayhi salam. The word namus means the one who bears secrets, and he's referring to Jibreel alayhi salam. That this is Jibreel alayhi salam, the same angel that Allah sent to Musa alayhi salam. Why didn't he say Isa alayhi salam? He's a Christian. Why didn't he say Isa alayhi salam? Because 
the way that Jibreel came to the Prophet, to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is like the way that Jibreel came to Musa Islam, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and Musa Islam have more similarities in, in their being than Isa Alayhi Salam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he said, this is the same Namus, this is the same angel, the bearer of secrets, the bearer of secrets that Allah sent down to Musa Alayhi Salam. At that point, uh, Waraqa is, is not even you know, thinking about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says to him, you know, at that point he says, Inna nabiyu hadhi al -umma, right? He, he actually confirms to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are the Prophet of this people. Like I knew it was coming. You are the Nabi. You are the Prophet of this people. And Waraqa immediately, immediately says, Ya laytani fiha jad'a, laytani akunu hayyan, إِذْ يُخْرِجُكَ قومك. He said, I wish I was young. I wish I was young. SubhanAllah, he's in his 90s now. He's blind. He lived his life, didn't get married, learned Hebrew, learned the scriptures. Like Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a lifelong pursuer of truth, trying to find Allah, following the ways of the prophets that came before. And the man who he married to his cousin, the man who he knew his entire life from his childhood, is in front of him, and now immediately Waraqa says it's him. And he, you know, before he even goes into detail, he says to him, Laytani fiha jada'a. I wish I had jada'a. Jada'a is like um, uh, youth, right? I wish I still had that young strength. I wish I still had that young strength, that strength of youth. I wish I would be alive the day that your people run you out. Now, the Prophet وسلم, has no idea of the implications of what just happened. First of all, you just told me I'm a prophet. <laughs> and then right after you told me I'm a prophet, you say your people are going to run you out, which is unimaginable. It's already enough that you just receive the news that you are a prophet of Allah. On top of that, your people are going to run you out. I wish I could be with you when your people run you out. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ أَوَ مُخْرِجِيَهُمْ Wait, are my people going to run me out? How is that possible? My people will run me out? And Waraqa says, نَعَمْ لَمْ يَأْتِي رَجُلٌ قَطْ بِمِثْلِ مَا جِئْتَ بِهِ إِلَّا عُودِيَ Yes, no man has ever come with what you have come except that his people took him as an enemy. There's so much to unpack here. Number one, the Prophet Sallallahu obviously from his perspective, all of this coming down on him. He cannot imagine his people taking him as an enemy. The Prophet Sallallahu has never had a single person bring a complaint against him. The Prophet Sallallahu is everyone's peacemaker. The Prophet Sallallahu is the one who brings together warring tribes that otherwise cannot be brought together. He's the man that stands for justice. Khadija radiallahu anha just told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, لا يخزيك الله أبدا. Allah will never disgrace you and mention all the khair, all the good he does for the people. And on top of that now, Waraqa's first reaction, Khadija's first reaction is Allah will never disgrace you. Waraqa's first reaction, the people are going to disgrace you. The people will fight you. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is receiving this very quickly. And he's shocked. And Waraqa immediately says, look, it's not personal. It's not about you. It's about what you have. It's, it's about what you have. It's about the message that you have. You could be the best person in the world, the nicest person in the world, all of that. But it's about the substance. It's about the message that Allah has given you. The Prophet ﷺ has not received any commands yet to give da'wah or anything. But Waraqa can see. He knows the way that this has gone down for all of the prophets that came before, including the one whom he follows, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him. He knows how this goes. So it's not about you, Ya Muhammad. They don't hate you as a person. But it's the message that you bring that will threaten them. And Waraqa's immediate reaction was what? I wish I was young. I wish I could be with you when your people run you out. And you know what Waraqa tells him as support? This 90-something blind man says to him, وَإِنْ يُدْرِكَنِي يومك, If I live to see that day, أَنْصُرُكَ نَصْرًا مُؤَزَّرًا I will support you 
with everything I have. Mu'azzara, with all of my strength. Whatever Allah has given me to support you with, I will support you with it. SubhanAllah. I mean, it's, it's really beautiful. There's so much to talk about this. Um, and Aisha radiallahu anha says he died just a few days after that. <laughs> so he didn't live, but just a few days after he tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that if I'm alive to see that day, I'm going to support you with everything I have. I wish I was young, but I hope Allah keeps me alive so I can be by your side. Um, there's so much to go with this. And Aisha radiallahu anha says he just died a few days after and the revelation was paused. That's when the fatra uh, happened to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Number one, al-niya saliha, that good intention. Min al-mu'minina rijalun sadaqu ma'ahadullah alayhi. There are people that are truthful when they make promises to Allah. They're not, they don't offer lip service. Waraqa was sincere in saying, this 90-year-old blind man will be by your side and will fight on your behalf. Because Waraqa does not just know the signs of prophethood. Waraqa knows the virtues of those who follow prophets in their most difficult times. And Waraqa wants to be like the Hawariyin, the, the righteous ones, right? I want to be your righteous Sahabi. I want to be your disciple. I want to be there by your side when your people come after you. Because this is going to go down like Isa alayhi salam, like Jesus, peace be upon him. And I want to be there by your side. I want to be that person to share that burden uh, with you. Also, Waraqa did not ask Allah for takhfif. He asked Allah for quwwah. He didn't ask Allah to lighten the load. He asked Allah for the strength to bear it. And that's a sign of his sincerity. He could have said, I hope Allah makes it easy and I'm an old man and we're not going to be able to bear this. And No, Waraqa asked Allah for the strength because Waraqa wanted the full reward of being alongside the Prophet ﷺ. That's his natural reaction. I've been living nine decades, almost an entire century for this moment to support a Prophet, to support that Prophet when he comes. Waraqa is the only Christian left over there in Mecca, the only one. Zayd is dead. It's just Waraqa. I've been waiting my whole life. I'm ready, right? I'm ready. I've rehearsed for this moment intentionally. I have purified myself. And he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And by the way, him dying a few days after, don't think Waraqa's burden would have been easy. Because Quraysh knew that there were certain influential voices. If they spoke in support of the Prophet ﷺ, things would be very messy for them. So you know what Nofal did? Nofal was the one who tied Abu Bakr and his Zubair together and tortured them together privately. See, the powerful ones were not tortured out in the public. They were tortured amongst their tribes. The tribes wanted to maintain the dignity of the tribe in a twisted way, maintain the dignity of the tribe, but at the same time, deterred their own from accepting Islam. So Al-Qarinayn, the two Qareens, the two tied ones, were Abu Bakr and his Zubair. It was, Waraq, it was Nofal that was tying them together and torturing them. Nofal, the one who used to put a Zubair in a mat, tie him up in a straw mat and set the mat on fire from the bottom so it would burn his feet and roll him and punish him and beat him. And the Zubayr screams being heard out of their qariya, out of their area. So imagine if Waraqa would have, with his authority, with the respect he had amongst the Arab, amongst the Arabs, imagine if Waraqa lived to see those days. Waraqa would have been amongst the first people tortured. They might have killed him privately and said he died a natural death because they would not have been able to afford the voice of Waraqa from a spiritual authority perspective being lent to the call of the Prophet But subhanAllah, Allah chose that this man, unlike Zaid, lives to see the Prophet lives to see him as a Nabi, and it's as if Allah kept him alive just to see that moment and to die. Dies a natural death just a few days after telling the Prophet ﷺ what he saw before the Prophet ﷺ would ever have any follow-up from Jibreel ﷺ. Waraqa passes away. Um, there's a narration with some, some weakness in it because it doesn't match up. And the Dhahabi rahimahullah talks about it that Waraqa would live and he would see Bilal radiallahu anhu being tortured and he would say, Ahadun Ahad ya Bilal, uh, one God, one, one God, O Bilal, Sabran ya Bilal, uh, warning the people about killing Bilal radiallahu anhu, but it doesn't match up to the, to, to the authentic hadith in al Bukhari that he died 
just a few days after that moment. Also, we don't have any follow-up. Bilal radiallahu anhu accepted Islam after the public call. So we would have had more on Waraqa had he lived to see that. So Waraqa dies just a few days after. Now, what does that mean about his status? This is where it gets very interesting. He's the first man to believe in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So is he a Sahabi? Is he a companion? Or not? Is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu the first man? As you commonly hear? Or is Waraqa the first man? What do you all think? Let's take a vote and just solve this in Valley Ranch now, 1400 years later. How many of you think Waraqa was a Sahabi? And is considered the first man to become a Muslim? Alright, how many of you think he's not a Sahabi? I guess a lot of you just don't know. You don't want to answer. Good answer. Okay. Um, there is ikhtilaf. There is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars because they want, they, you know, oftentimes they're trying to reconcile how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu plays into this. Because commonly, Khadija radiallahu anhu is the first woman, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is the first man. But here is Waraqa telling him, You're a prophet. Not just saying that you're a prophet, but saying, look, if I live, I'm going to support you. I will support you. I will fight on your side. I will make sure that no one uh, hurts you. So some of the scholars came up with very interesting ways to try to resolve this. So some of them said, like a Dhahabi, Adraka Nubuwa Walam Yudrik Risala. He caught the prophethood of the Prophet, but he didn't live to see the message of the Prophet. Because the Prophet still had not been told to call the people yet. He just he was just resolving himself what was happening to him. So he caught the appointment of the Prophet ﷺ as a Nabi, as a Prophet, but not the Risala, not the Da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ, not the message. So therefore, uh, he died Musaddiq, as someone who confirmed the Prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ, as a believer, but not a Sahabi, because he didn't technically join the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, because he didn't live to become a Muslim in the formal sense. Some of the scholars said he died in the fatra, he died in the pause. So they had a similar conclusion. They said he's a believer. They said he's a, he's a mu'min. But we can't say he's a sahabi. Another group of scholars actually wrote entire rasa'il, like al-Baghdadi, um, you know, uh, al-Khatib al-Baghdadi and others um, who wrote these rasa'il, who wrote these treatises and messages saying that no, he was indeed a sahabi and waraqa is indeed the first male companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we say radiallahu ta'ala anhu and we consider him that first Sahabi of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there is an interesting difference of opinion. And like Zayd, Waraqa's situation confuses even the close companions. So remember with Zayd, it was Sa'id his son and Umar his, his, his uh, cousin coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and saying, Ya Rasulullah, what happened to Zayd? Does he go to Jannah? Does he go to Paradise? Does he go to Hellfire? Is he a believer? Is he... What do we say about Zayd? So think about this one now. Khadija, radiallahu anha, an authentic hadith, asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, innahu kana qad sadaqaq. He confirmed, he believed in you. He confirmed you were who you were. وَإِنَّهُ مَاتَ قَبْلَ أَن تُظْهَرُ And he, he died before you were made public. Your da'wah was public. Like what them, what sin did this man commit? What would happen to him? So the Prophet ﷺ responds to Khadija, this concerned woman over her cousin and over this man who was so precious to the Prophet ﷺ and Khadija's life and who, I mean, you talk about a niya salihah, he did not just say, I believe in you. He said, I'm going to fight on your side. I will support you against all odds. The Prophet says, Ya Khadija, O oh Khadija, ra'aytu waraqa fil manam wa alayhi thiyabun bayal. I saw waraqa in my sleep and he was wearing these, these white clothes and garments. And he said to her that, Walau kana min ahlin nar, if he was to be from the people of hellfire, then I would not have seen him in that state. That he looked absolutely fine, he looked beautiful, he looked assured. In another narration, um, there was a person, this is narrated in Ibn, from Ibn Asakir in, in, in Tariq uh, Dimashq, Bisanad in Sahih, 
that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked, "Su'ila, su'ila Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam an waraqa." فقال أبصرته في بطنان الجنة عليه السندس. I saw him. He was asked about waraqa. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I saw waraqa in the middle of Jannah, like literally in the stomach of it. Okay, in the belly of Jannah." وعليه السندس, and he was wearing silk, so he looked absolutely fine. He looked like he was in Jannah, and he looked like he was in absolute beauty and na'im uh, in, in the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one more hadith in uh, Al-Hakim, also uh, an interesting hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. Uh, she says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sami'a rajulun, he heard a man, yasubbu ala waraqa, who was cursing waraqa or mentioning waraqa in a bad way. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, لا تسب ورقة Do not say anything negative or bad about ورقة أما علمت أني رأيت لورقة جنة أو جنتين Don't you know that I saw ورقة in Jannah not just with one level but actually even with two Jannahs two gardens, two levels in paradise So these are the ahadith about ورقة And subhanAllah, I was thinking about this it's really interesting that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned for Zayd and Waraqa two Jannahs. Right? If you remember last week, we talked about Zayd ibn Amr and the Prophet ﷺ said, رَأَيْتُ لَهُ جَنَّتَيْنَ I saw that he had two gardens, two levels of paradise. And he says the same thing about Waraqa. And so it's really interesting because if you look in the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانَ For the one who fears the, the, the station of their Lord, the, the, the greatness of their Lord. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, standing in front of being, being beholden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that moment, right? Being, being resurrected in front of Allah the Almighty, fears that moment. Jannatan, our two gardens. And the Mufassirun generally say that the reason why Allah mentions this, because this is talking about a person that committed a sin, made tawbah to Allah, and then uh, immersed themselves in good. So basically the two Jannas refer to their leaving off sin, and then they're immersing themselves in good. Because when a person repents from a sin, the sin turns into a good deed. So Allah gives them a jannah for their leaving off that major sin, or that, or that sin, that, that place of disobedience, and replaces it with another jannah because of the good that they then exert themselves in. So they don't just make tawbah, they live their lives in good as a result of the lessons learned from that tawbah. So, lahum jannatan. They have two jannahs. And subhanAllah for Zayd and Waraqa, for the Prophet ﷺ to be very specific about both of them and say that they have two Jannahs, right? And there could be many reasons for this. One, that they believed twice in a way, right? They believed before the Prophet ﷺ even came and when they knew of a Prophet, they expressed another level of belief. So clearly, they've got a distinction amongst even the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ and that they believed when no one else believed. And then again, when they were told that the Prophet had come out, they believed once again. Why is that significant? Because there were some people that were in Medina waiting for the Prophet ﷺ. As soon as they knew who he was, they said, no, 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 not him. Right? So they knew a Prophet was coming. They dedicated themselves to Tawheed, to monotheism. But once it was him, Muhammad ﷺ, from Banu Hashim, we can't do that one. Right? So the fact that Zayd was on his way back to embrace this Prophet, Waraqa confirmed this Prophet, and both of them upheld monotheism even in Jahiliyyah. Allahu Ta'ala Alam, but that could be one of the wisdoms for why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that they have two Jannahs. The last thing which is extremely powerful, um, and it's just a beautiful transition if you think about it. The last way that Allah mentions Jesus, Isa Alayhi Salam in the Quran is how? You can tell me. In the Quran. Those of you that memorize the Qur'an, you can go through it or think. When's the last mention of Isa salam in the Qur'an? Of Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Qur'an? Yeah. No, no, in the Qur'an. If you're reading the Qur'an front to back, when's the last time you hear about Jesus? Isa salam. Who said it? Surah Al-Saf. And what happens in Surah Al-Saf? وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاءِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ 
literally the last mention of Isa alayhi salam in the Quran is very beautiful. Isa alayhi salam is telling his people about the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right? That I've confirmed to you what came before me of the Torah and I'm here to give you the glad tidings of the Prophet that will come after me, Ismuhu Ahmad, right? Whose name will be Ahmad. How beautiful is it that the first person to confirm the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ is the last follower of Isa ﷺ in Mecca. SubhanAllah, like the first one to accept the Prophet ﷺ was the lone Christian in Mecca who was exerting himself to follow the true way of Isa ﷺ, to follow Ibrahim, Isa, to follow the way of the Prophets. And he's the first one to confirm, إِنَّكَ نَبِيُّ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ It's you. You're the Prophet of this Ummah, and then he dies. That it was not one of the pagan Arabs. It was not someone else. The first person to tell him, you are a Prophet. You're the one is following the Bushra of Isa Islam, the glad tidings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and handing that off to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he dies, and the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam picks up uh, right from where Isa Islam, where Jesus, peace be upon him, left off, continuing that legacy of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that Zayd ibn Amr said that he was upon the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So subhanAllah, it's a very, if you just think about the wisdom upon wisdom upon wisdom of how this is happening, and the beautiful mercies that Allah has embedded in just the succession here of the prophets of Allah, uh, it's incredibly beautiful. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with waraqa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to join us with him and with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and with Khadija Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha and with Zayd and those righteous ones in the highest level of Jannat al Firdaus, with the Prophets of Allah, with the Siddiqeen, with the Shuhada, with all of those righteous ones that perceive and we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma Ameen. Inshallah Ta'ala, I will take questions. And by the way, this is the last week we're gonna Facebook live stream this. So if you're watching this on Facebook, inshallah ta'ala from next week on, we're gonna uh, please register for the series. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, it has the notes there as well, so you can follow along with Allah ta'ala. Uh, so please start next week. And those of you that are here, uh, please continue to come. The barakah of being in the masjid and in the majlis is greater than being at home and watching online. So maybe it's an encouragement as well, inshallah, for us to come to the masjid and be a part of it. Jazakumullah khair.